Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ask Me Anything About Getting a Job as a Conversation Designer. We are so excited you're here today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We have so many people tuning in from all over the world. I hope you had a great week. Happy Friday. I hope you're staying safe. We have a great conversation coming up, great questions that have been submitted by everyone. Some surprises coming up. I see people saying hi in the chat already. We are going to run a Discord chat. Tell us where you're from. We've got people from everywhere, Australia, Spain, Italy, South Africa, England, the Netherlands. So just pop in there. We have 91 attendees at this point, still growing. All right. And we have a fun contest to start us off. So to spread the word to your network, get your friends to come join in too. We are giving away some free bot mock masks. Mm -hmm. We want everyone to stay safe out there. And these are not just any masks. These are actually really nice fabric masks. Um, they are by Flexi Supplies on Etsy in case you want to buy your own. But if you want to win a free one, you can right now and go ahead and click retweet with comment. And then the Botmark team has chosen an emoji. If the emoji that you put in your retweet, con uh, your retweet, matches ours we will send you a mask so if you want to go ahead and do that right now and i am going to run through some final housekeeping things uh this is being recorded so if you can't stay the whole time don't worry we are going to email it to you and go ahead and in the uh, discord chat put your questions and comments as we go we're up to 100 attendees, so thank you all for joining. We're so excited that you're here. If you didn't catch it earlier, we're going to have a Discord chat so that you can access all of the resources that are mentioned during the webinar afterwards. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our incredible panelists that have joined us today. First, we have Lance Moncrief. Lance is the Chief Experience Officer and Global Leader for the Experience AI Practice with an Artificial Intelligence and Analytics at Cognizant. He has led customer-centric strategies and experience engagements for over 20 years, and today he leads a team that humanizes data and intelligence into ambient AI customer experiences. Lance's global AI efforts focus on emerging experiences such as conversational AI, smart spaces and things, augmented intelligence, behavioral biometrics, emotional AI, AR, VR, computer vision, edge applications, embedded intelligence, and agentless self-service. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lance. Sure. Next, we have Simony Wilson. <clears throat> Simony has a master's degree in computational linguistics from Georgetown University and over 20 years experience working in the speech and GUI design space during a career that has included working with large companies such as Microsoft and GM, small companies, startups, and contracting too. She has broad knowledge and experience in the GUI design space, as well as extensive experience with GUI, voice user interface, tuning, authentication, and fraud prevention. She has also published and has spoken at many conferences including Speech Tech. Thank you for joining us today, Stephanie. All right, next we have Alice. Alice focuses on recruiting within voice tech and conversational AI and everything that comes with building a conversational team. She has a background in operating and scaling tech startups, working with global enterprises, as well as experience leading HR and recruiting recruitment functions. Thank you for joining us today, Alice. And last but definitely not least, Mike Poston is a founding team member of Spilled Creative, a creative agency located in NYC 
have solely focused on voice and conversational experiences. Mike manages the agency's client relationships and account services department, while also playing a key role in project management and strategy on key partners initiatives. Coming from his past experience in digital brand building, Mike has always been inspired about cross-media, interactive experiences. So when it comes to voice, he loves thinking through multimodal strategy, specifically how voice can be a UI tool, a user interface tool, for visual smart display experiences. Mike's passion, passions lie in collaborating with creative talent and contributing in brand and customer experience strategy. Thank you for joining us, Mike. All right, so first question. What skills or experience are you looking for in potential candidates you are wanting to hire? Simony, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I've thought about this for, for decades now that I've been involved in this space. You know, it's kind of gone through an evolution, but what's been the same this whole time is that there isn't one a degree or one skill set that really you can just go pluck somebody out of college and say, yes, that's a buoy designer or that's somebody who's a conversation designer. So I've always found it to be um, more important to look for um, the, the passion and the potential. Um, people who are good in this space tend to have a natural affinity for the customer perspective. So it doesn't matter whether it's voice or chatbot or some combination, but you're always thinking about how to make things more usable um, and get people to their result faster. So it's really more about something than when you're interviewing. You can see that passion. You can see that perspective. Um, other things that I often look for are just that um, ability for communication and particularly cross team communication, as well as um, customer facing communication. And that might be an external or an internal customer. But there are sort of these soft um, uh, skill sets that I look for versus, you know, knowing somebody has a computer science degree that's going to make that happen. It's not. Um, often, more often than not, um, I like to see a combination of those skills, you know, whether it's the computer science area or human computer interaction. Um, psychology is a good background for this. So, you know, I'm open to a wide range of what actual qualifications might be on somebody's resume before I then have a conversation with them to, to determine if they have these other skills that I think are even, you know, as important. Yeah, I would, I would agree with a lot of, of uh, what was just mentioned as well. For me, the majority of people who are coming into this space are coming into something brand new. It's not something that existed for 10 or 15 years before, so you couldn't possibly be educated towards it. But what you find then is, at least what I look for, an intellectual curiosity, right? Because no matter who, even if you're versed in UX design and some of the other creative traditional spaces, you're going to have to drop some of those habits to do something completely different in this space, right? Uh, and so I really don't care about the experience in the traditional spaces, intellectual curiosity first. And then there are things about each of us that you know, we might be more empathetic or more sympathetic uh, and, uh, and, and really want to help other folk. Those innate qualities in people those are the kind of folks that when you put here uh, and mold them appropriately, they'll be able to succeed. Um, so those are the skill sets, that kind of the mindset that I look for as opposed to experience. I don't look for experience unless it's a leadership position where you're gonna be running a specific BU or department. And that's not what we're speaking about here as we're thinking about dialogue designers and conversational designers. I totally echo what uh, both of the other panelists just said. I think that was very eloquently put. Um, I would just sort of reinforce and, and frame it a little bit differently. One adage that we have at Skilled Creative, and, and I truly believe that we employ this in our recruitment and hiring process, is we, we say that we look for really hire people and not for a role. So I think that that echoes a bit what uh, the other two panelists just mentioned, where this is in a space where there's a tremendous amount of talent that has 
years of experience or education specifically um, in this space because it is so new. Um, and building on what Simone said is, I think what I really look for when looking for team members or interviewing folks um, to get involved in projects is really that balance between creative and technology, um, which very much I find lands in, in user experience, user interface design or background. Um, I believe this technology and the experiences that we're designing, developing and launching um, more so than any medium or platform I've worked on in the past really is striking the right balance between scripting and creative and user flow. Um, but it is so much grounded in the back end technology and the way that it works that I think the folks that are most successful in this space are open minded. Um, they are not um, looking at just one side of the equation. They're thinking about the user, the back end of the experience, the front end of the experience, how it feels, how it operates. Um, so I would just say versatility and a user focused mindset are some of the key qualities that I'm looking for when, when speaking to folks about opportunities in the space. Definitely agree with everything that has just sort of been mentioned from the other panelists. I think that a big thing is really around transferable skills. As it's already been mentioned, there's not really any certain pathway into this industry. So it brings a lot of diversity. We've seen you know, people from linguistics backgrounds, um, audio, it's just a complete mix, which really brings a lot of uh, new ideas and creativity to the industry. So it's quite a hard one to um, really nail down. Again, it just does come down to the uh, type of role and the seniority as well. Obviously, if um, a company is looking for someone in more of a senior position, it's likely they're going to be leading projects or teams. So it does um, change that a little bit. And obviously they would expect some industry experience, um, but usually it tends to be fairly flexible. You know, I think everyone that's in this industry realizes and appreciates the, the stage that it's at and people are all learning together and, and there's sort of no right or wrong answer really. So yeah, I would, uh, I would agree on that. Uh, for Lance and Ellis. Seems the job market usually looks for conversation designers as people with technical or programming backgrounds. How do we change this perception? And this is from Crystal. A great question, uh, Crystal. I think that the industry is actually shifting this right now, right? So, um, and I think uh, all work effort will, will go towards shifting it as well. Uh, no longer do you have implementation as something that drives what happens in conversational AI. Uh, predominantly now, the experience that you're looking to create is what drives it. And as, as uh, conversational AI has matured, it has not matured in silo. So it has matured as an enabler to a number of other things that have to happen together in order to provide really sweet experiences for customers. They demand that. So experience is driving a lot of this and you're gonna see a lot of hiring. This kind of format here today uh, is an example of that. Uh, hiring for experience, really trying to figure out what someone brings to the table. Uh, and unfortunately, within conversational AI, whether it's message, chat, or voice, we have had a good three and a half, four years of a healthy amount of failure uh, with just implementation. Um, really rigid, uh, impersonal, um, uh, clunky experiences. And that is driving uh, adoption down in some areas. And where the spend is now is how can we increase experience, right? So it is, it is happening organically within the space, certainly from an enterprise level standpoint. Uh, the impact uh, for folk who have joined today's session will be who's hiring and what's their mindset and how attuned are they to the change that's taking place. So if you're being hired by an IT manager, IT is going to be a thing, even if you're being hired as the experienced person, quote unquote. I think those things will gradually change over time. I expect 18 months 
and beyond. Uh, this will be uh, become, uh, this won't even be a question that you'll have, right? Uh, and it has changed over the last couple of years. It's maybe just slow in some, some other areas. Allie? I agree. I guess it's still sort of um, that learning stage and, and companies and, you know, well, companies and the industry are, are finding their feet still. So it is going to evolve naturally and organically. Um, I think it does depend on the company. Like uh, you said, Lance, you know, if it's... Um, uh, an IT company and it just depends on, on the role of the company and what they're looking for. I think traditionally startups tend to uh, prefer people to wear many hats. Uh, we all know how startup work works and it, and it works best both as a cost effective um, point of view and for a lot of other reasons. So sometimes you might find that there's a bit more of an emphasis um, on that sort of split role in a, in a, tech, in a startup environment. Um, but again, it comes down to, to the company and their perspective and um, take on it. Uh, I actually done a poll on this um, within, uh, the other day and was actually quite interested by the, the results. It seems fairly um, split over, you know, yes, no, and, you know, there's sort of no preference. So it's interesting to see people's thoughts. Um, I personally think that it's two separate jobs now there are people out there that do both and you know they are really great candidates and you know it, it definitely depends but i think that usually uh, developers like the technical side and they, that's their sort of thing and you know is it should it be mixed with the creativity and, and the design side effectively it's two very different uh, roles so i think it, there's a lot of uh, variations to to it and I think I agree with Lance that over time it's gonna naturally sort of find its place and, and it won't even be a, a question anymore. I, I, I think um, if I can add to, to Alice and, and my uh, response so far is that there's an additional change that's taking place. What we're finding is that even folk who are adept at creating conversational interactivity if they're not in love with data, if they really don't care about the data that brings someone to the conversational space and what happens to that data, all the behavioral data, all the customer data, all the product data, all the service data, all the interaction data, if that's not top of mind for you, then you're not going to... Uh, you're not going to rise in this space as well as others. You can't really design for that data unless you really are passionately in love with it. And it doesn't mean that you're a developer or a technical mind. It just means that you need to be in love with the idea of the data that's flowing around us and that connects us. That is something that has nothing to do with IT and nothing to do with creative, but everything to do with the conversational space. And folk find that out sometimes too late uh, when they come in. But they like the idea of the interface, but they're not a fan of all of the stuff that happens underneath the engine, right? So that's something that folk are, are coming to grips with it as well. Great points. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, great points, Lance and Alice. All right, next question. All four panelists expressed interest in answering this one. Or these two questions. Who would I be working with as a conversation designer? Which roles on the team would I interface with? Well, go back. <laughs> Regularly, and what other team members and skill sets are essential to implement voice or chatbots? I think it segues well from that data comment because um, in, in my experience, and I've worked in a lot of different capacities as a conversation designer, um, but I think to be really effective, you end up working with a large variety of groups and team members. And one of them um, is definitely researchers um, who, you know, love data even more than I do, um, whether they're building a product or they're analyzing the data for you. But I absolutely um, always harp on building. You want to get the theory right. You want to make sure you're putting all of your best practices and your usability considerations in place, but at some point you need to put it in the customer's hands and get that data. 
and analyze that data. And, and that is my favorite place to be. I love going through that data. And so I think that is a shared um, skill. Um, but then you have to be open, even, you know, as I am desirous of those, of those answers, even if they're all bad answers. If the data says you completely got this wrong, you need to be open to that and making the necessary changes. Um, and that's what I always say at some point, I wanna get it to the customers and find out what's terrible about it. I wanna, I want, what, what did we miss? That's the exciting space for me. Obviously you always miss something. Um, it would be boring otherwise, but so, so that's one group, researchers and just yourself working with the data. But um, you know, you're always working hand in hand with developers as well. So you need to be able to communicate your design in a way that your developers can consume. I think this gets back to the point of particularly developers and researchers often have the reputation of having a different way of communicating than other people. You have to be able to switch those modes to do that crossing communication, whether you're talking to a researcher or developer or perhaps a project manager or a product manager all the way down to customers. They take those different skill sets because you will at some point, um, unless you're very, very junior, work with all of them in some capacity and so you build that skill over time as well but you might have that that sort of knack um, for that cross-team communication i agree with that uh, uh, for for us within our space of cognizant um, there's such a wide group you've got data scientists that you're going to be working with you've got developers you're going to be working with um, you know, uh, researchers have just been mentioned. But if you, if you think of a core project team, right, um, you, you know, I, I have agency background. So for me, the creative director and the copywriter have always been together. And really great things happen from that kind of union. So within our setting, you've got an experience director who's really thinking around the experience of voice and interaction with chat and so forth and you have a dialogue design lead. And these two come together, they're the ones that make the magic happen. So at a minimum, you've got two minds that are thinking about conversation and experience, uh, but they can't do this in silo. So there are going to be uh, data scientists, there are gonna be solution architects, there are gonna be a bevy of developers, uh, there is a technical PM, and then there's a traditional PM, and that's just the core for uh, let's say a traditional chatbot, okay? Um, but you'll have others who will be able to come in uh, on this. For the, 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 uh, the dialogue designer, the conversational designer, they will also be interfacing with folk from the account and from verticals, right? So depending on the organization that you're in, you may have an account person who only has one brand, but they may work within a vertical that only thinks of insurance, for example. And you may have access to those people and will need to convince them of the kind of interactions that are needed um, and tap into some of the insights that they have there. So though they may not be critical to the core team, they are critical to the business need. And if anything at all, from a project team standpoint, uh, the role of a conversational designer or the experience director is really to translate the needs and opportunities from a business standpoint into now this experience that's meant to touch an end consumer. That translation will need to be made for the data scientists who really only care about understanding and analyzing all this really great data and for developers who just wanna go down a checklist often in order to enable a function within uh, you know, Google CC ad or, you know, something within Amazon Next, right? Um, so there is the people that you're working with that are core to the team, but then there are the folks that you need to tap into in order to do a really good job of translation. You know, I'll, I'll pause there. I'll, I'll make mine quick because, again, I, I share a lot of the same thoughts um, as, as the previous two panelists. Um, I would just build on it and, and my approach and my thought may be slightly different. Our agency skills creative, we always start by saying we're a creative agency first. So I think that we bring a lot of 
the mindset that you may be um, used to thinking about when working with a digital creative agency or even a traditional creative agency. And beckoning back to what I was speaking about before, um, we're looking for people who are a good mix um, and a good addition to a team. And I think what I was really excited about on this panel is by nature, I tend to think that the, the term or the description of conversational designer is very broad. So uh, building on what Lance said is, we normally will build uh, a team of experts that we have on, on our core staff. And based on the project, there will be a number of experts on each project. So core roles being senior developers, um, copywriters, creative director, project and account managers. And then we're really getting into this smart display sp space, which sort of adds in the layer of design, interactivity, um, HTML, responsive design type thinking. So when I think of a conversational designer, I more so look to what that person is strongest in. And I happen to think that they can either augment or even fill one of those various roles on a team. But in the most broad sense, I think that by nature in the title, conversation designer, um, you're building in uh, thinking around copy UX design. So really being able to think about all of these things and work across all of these disciplines and almost be the glue or the bridge between all of these um, makes a dedicated conversation designer on a project extremely valuable. But again, this is a new space. We are a small and growing agency as there are um, many of the agencies in the space. So by having a conversation designer as part of staff or included on a project, I see that person as somebody who can sort of jump in and help on the various elements of the project, whether it be the copy itself, the UX design, um, working with the creative team on some of the visual design or creative strategy. Um, so again, I agree that there's many, many people that you'll be working with. And I think sort of that versatility to understand and be able to dive into specific areas when and where needed um, is a core strength of a conversation designer. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, um, I guess just to just to keep it short, because I think everything's sort of been touched on already that um, it does, there is a sort of big mix and you won't just be, um, you know, sort of speaking with just the development, for example, there's, there's a lot involved. Um, but I think the key thing is being able to um, transition and adapt when you're speaking to different um, people within the team. So, you know, even if that's QA and test, for example, there may be a time when you need to be speaking to those sorts of people and being able to understand uh, from their perspective. So, yeah, I think that the key sort of uh, roles have been mentioned already, um, but yeah. <laughs> All right, next question. How much will the field grow? Teresa, all four of our panelists wanted to answer this one too. Mike, do you want to start? Sure. I think um, this is probably the easiest question to answer so far. Um, I think the answer is a lot and yes, um, in the shortest way possible. Um, I've been working in the space personally for just about three years. And when I joined, um, I didn't have an Alexa. I didn't have a voice device. I was very intrigued by the space. And in doing workshops, uh, panels, things uh, like we're doing today, we would start by asking everybody, you know, have you heard of Amazon Alexa? Then a year later, we were asking, do you have an Amazon Alexa? A few short months later, it was, how many Amazon Alexa's Google Assistant devices do you have? And now um, the conversation has even extended much past sort of this consumer facing conversation of asking people their perception of it. But every brand, every organization that we're working with at this point 
has either built a portfolio of experiences, is actively working on enterprise strategy or actively building. And at the very least, um, and I would say that any organization that is not actively working in this space is already, um, if not one, but a, a few steps behind. But uh, I don't I don't believe I've spoken to any clients or partners or brands or prospects in at least the last six to 12 months that have not said there is more than a strong interest to be working in the space or even that we have a voice task force um, within our large organization. So I believe that we're, um, and this is taking a phrase um, from Amazon, and, and what they'll say is we're in the second inning of a, a nine inning game. So I think that we're really starting to hit a point of maturity, understanding by consumers and organizations. And I happen to think that 2020, 2021 may be the best time to be getting into the space as it is really, really starting to grow um, and take hold. Yeah, I would just like to add to that. That's that's perfect. That sort of hits all the bullet points I was thinking of, but that's a perfect segue into adding that at this very time, the elephant in the room is the COVID-19 um, issue that's happening and how that's affected all of us. We're having this session online and that was possible before and people were doing it, but that's something that more and more people are doing and getting familiar with and comfortable with. And I think that that is going to ex extend to a lot more adoption, a lot, a lot faster than even we had anticipated. Um, in addition to uh, issues like COVID causing people to think about doing more things or rather less things in person. So more things through devices um, or in apps or online. Um, and they're gonna want this new modality that has grown. Um, it's just much more natural. And that's what the, more and more people are gonna be expecting. So I think that it's amplified even by the very time that we're in, um, that's going to make it leaps and bounds even beyond everything that you just described as well around the, the whole COVID thing that we're seeing a lot more companies um, looking at different ways to reach their customers and automate things. So um, I think it's definitely, whilst it's fairly still in its infancy, a great time to get involved and sort of find your place uh, rather than sort of leave it too late. It's, you know, you can really, if, if you get in early, it's always it's always a good thing. Obviously, it's, it's never too late, but um, I think it's it's a great time uh, now, especially, you know, everyone's learning together. There's sort of no right or, or wrong way. So it's a nice time to be able to be part of an industry like that. And the it's definitely grown. I think we, no one would say that it's, that it's not, uh, it's definitely going up rather than, rather than down. So yeah, definitely a, a, a lot of sort of career path. I, I obviously agree with the rest of the panelists, but I think there's a different dimension here expect that this is not just going to grow, it's going to change, right? And I think significantly uh, where, you know, three years before it was something that would be able to provide you entertainment, right? At most, when you think of voice, you know, you choose a device, you play my music, play my playlist, you know, check the weather, things like that that are fairly um, uh, simple to do. Uh, the transactional nature uh, of uh, conversational AI, the supportive, predictive nature uh, that is possible within conversational AI, now is going to seep, and it's already starting to do so, right, um, into the workforce, right? So it's not just something that you have within your home. Uh, it's not just something that you have as like, a wearable or that you have in your car. These are things that are driving uh, efficiencies in the workforce, uh, whether it's sales teams outside or folk in the factory. And as such, it's not just going to be conversational AI. It's going to be conversational AI along with edge computing, along with image recognition. Uh, it's going to be all of these together. So because those things are experience-oriented things, it's going to open up more avenues for folk who are looking, coming into conversational AI now, 
to spread their wings into other areas and extend the experience beyond simply just the voice experience, right? That's one. Number two, even if it doesn't change right now, let's pretend there is no more change that's possible. What's possible right now is going to be strategy as opposed to simply just dialogue design, right? Um, and really thinking about what the other, what, what are the kind of conversations that need to happen? And there's a maturity that will happen for folk who come into the space as well. Uh, I'm not sure, Mike, how you handle this. This would be really interesting to find out how you handle this on your end. But for me, traditionally, coming from the agency side, my first feeling was to pull people in from agency. Oh, this is just what we did before. It's just now in this new medium. And most of those folks fail at doing that because you bring habits of designing things that are for screens uh, that, and you know, copywriters who write things that are long copy and short copy that have to provide context before they make a point. That just does not happen in conversational AI. No one has the time for that. You have to drop those habits. Uh, so I think what happens is that there's a maturity in the way that people think about how they design. Designing dialogue is really around designing influenceable dialogue, right? That leads in a certain path. So I think there is a, a tremendous amount of growth uh, moving from copying to conversation to strategy. Uh, and then I think just the wider set of experiences with emerging technologies that will need to be tucked into conversational AI. I think those doors are just going to open up very, very wide. This is no different than moving from traditional digital, uh, traditional design to digital design, like 20 something years ago, yeah? And, and no one knew what UX was at that point, right? Um, uh, you just, you design posters, but what's this wireframe you're talking about? And really thinking about the way that people take things in and look at what has happened to UX. Conversational design is that open door that, I mean, we don't know what's going to be next. We'd be foolish to pretend that we do, but it's going to be pretty massive, right? Uh, so I'll pause there. The great, great, great opportunities for creators. Thank you. All right. Alice, do you want to start us off on this one? What would make a candidate with no experience competitive? This was from Suzanne. Try and show your passion and interest in the industry as much as possible. Um, the certain ways you can do this, um, you know, whether you've completed relevant courses, make that clear on your CV um, that, that you're sending to, to companies. Also try and um, look at different things you can do. For example, can you start writing um, blogs or articles? You know, it doesn't have to be in depth um, as an expert, it's just showing your perspective and showing that you're interested and engaging with the community. I think that's definitely a big thing. Um, and also try and have a go at even, you know, building uh, uh, or creating conversations. There's a lot of different um, solutions out there like dialogue flow, voice flow, or whatever you choose to use that you don't actually have to be technical to use. Um, and it gives you a good insight into to what's involved and you get a good flavor for it. If a company sees that you've actively gone out off your own back or in your spare time to do these things, um, you know, whether you have experience or not, it's definitely a big sort of uh, tick. Um, Another thing you can do as well is provide a covering letter. Uh, it doesn't have to be long, but just short and sweet. And you can include things like, for example, if you uh, attend a lot of webinars as well in the industry, or try and um, connect with people in the industry and make yourself known. And it's little things like that. It doesn't necessarily even matter if you've got experience. It's showing that you're willing to put yourself out there and learn. Um, and as Mike touched on before, it's more about the person a lot of the time rather than the actual experience. So if you can show that you are really willing to learn, then that usually goes a, a long, long way. Uh, again, agreed. Um, you know, um, just repeating myself by saying agreed, uh, and I'll probably keep doing it because um, we're in line. Uh, but here's, you know, I've decided I don't even look at resumes, right? I, I think that anything can go on a resume. Um, I believe for the next maybe 18 months, I need to talk to people, right? And find out where their mindset is. 
Uh, and when I speak to folk, what makes them competitive, again, is their intellectual curiosity. No one can tell me that they're a seasoned expert in conversational AI. No one can do it, right? Um, uh, because it doesn't exist, right? Um, I've only been doing this for four years, and I've got a tremendous amount of years of experience in, in wider industry. But I can't say that I'm some master of conversational AI. I'm a guide of it right now. And that's the best you can do. So if that's the case for me, for everyone else, you know, they're that or under. So um, I don't want to look at a resume. I want to know, are you willing to do something very different than what you have attempted to do before? And I want to know why, right? So some of the folk who are um, good candidates have kind of crested in their specific space. They believe the ceiling is either they've gotten to the ceiling or the ceiling is low. Uh, and they believe that maybe their shop doesn't do things uh, as uh, cutting edge as conversational AI and they want to make a switch. Or really, they really have rung the bell for the, the space that they're in and they have really excelled. And they just need to switch another gear, right? Uh, they just come to a different place in their career. Um, uh, so those milestones, those turning points are more important to me than a set of skills that you can say that you have, right? Um, if you're willing to make the switch, uh, then I'm willing to listen, right? And so, so that, that's the important thing. Uh, that's the important thing for me. Because as I said before in the, in the previous question, you're going to end up you're, you're coming into an area that's going, it's fluid right now and is going to change even more. So I need someone who is at the point where they're willing to change dramatically from what they were doing before to something brand new. Okay? So that's what I look for. Yeah, I, I agree fully. And just to add a little bit is, um, I think Lance has made some really good points in, in the last few questions and what I really think about, in addition to what the other two panelists just mentioned, is if somebody can demonstrate, and if it's the transition from tra traditional to digital, that's a very clear, um, basically, as Lance mentioned, we're sort of in that next iteration. So we went from traditional media to digital media. We often say, if, if you have experience in digital transformation, if you've gone from one medium to another, by nature, this space is so new, there, nobody can claim that they are the be all end all expert of voice or conversation design. So that element of curiosity is key. But I would say as a tip or a piece of advice, even if you're not making as, um, even if it's not coming from digital directly to voice, in whatever experience that you have or have had in the past, if you can show that you were doing something um, and then you were able to be agile, adaptable, transition, be curious and be successful in a new space and sort of move into a new space and learn and grow with it, um, I think being able to show adaptability um, an excitement about new things, um, a curiosity about new things, um, a willingness to learn. Um, I think those are the, the types of things that I love to hear um, from people who are getting into the space to be able to say that I was doing something, a new platform, a new technology, a new opportunity came up. I came in with fresh eyes and then I was able to do this and became successful in this. This is just another um, instance of where um, it's a new space, new people are coming in, and um, if you're adaptable, you're curious, uh, I think you'll be successful. Um, Alice, do you want to speak to average salary requirements? This one I know is a big question that everyone is always very curious about, and um, there's definitely an, uh, hardly any data um, out there when it comes to candidates trying to find out um, what sort of salaries they can um, 
be looking at. So um, I've got a, a bit of data myself and, and stuff like that. So this is very sort of ballpark figures. So don't uh, hold a gun to my head and hold me to these. But um, this is what it tends to be. And obviously, um, it depends on the company and your experience and the location as well is a big thing. Um, I've, I've put it into dollars just to um, keep it simple. So for junior and entry level roles you're looking between sort of 40 to 60 thousand dollars a year again this is very ballpark and would depend on on the company uh mid-range you're probably looking around 60 to 100 thousand dollars a year senior would be 100 to 130 and then if you're talking director and sort of leadership you'd be looking at um, 130 thousand dollars plus annually um again this is going to depend if for example it's a startup it may be that um you know you're offered slightly less on a base salary and potentially offered stock options or um, bonuses but again it there's not a lot of data out there obviously over time and organically we'll get more data and it'll be a lot more clear but as it stands at the moment the industry's very, very new, um, really, to, to the salary um, salary ranges and stuff. So that's hopefully that helps. But that's a very sort of broad uh, range. For that does help, Alice. Thank you. And on the same topic, do you think there should be a difference in pay if a person designs for voice only or chatbots only? Should the pay increase if they design for both? What has uh, your data shown you there? I think um, it companies pay um, people on the value that they can add. So obviously if a, if a person can bring more value to a company and they're able to work on different projects and whether that's voice and chatbots, it may be that um, they're, they'll pay a bit more. Um, again, there's no sort of hard data there to, to say for sure. It's still a bit um, up in the air. Um, but yeah, I think it, it depends. Uh, you know, agency tend to do both and there are companies out there that do offer both sort of voice based and travel based solutions so I think it comes down to the person and what they can bring to the company um, which would you know determine how the company would value them as a as a salary and stuff like that so yeah not a not a very straightforward answer but hopefully that that helps a bit <laughs> yeah I mean it, there is no difference for me in the work effort right so again as uh alice just mentioned what value are you bringing to the table so if you're joining a conversational ai team and you're a conversational designer you're going to be creating conversations for message platforms uh for uh, uh for voice for conversational ai some's going to be for mobile some's going to be desktop some's going to be device oriented uh, and there's a plethora of different platforms that you may end up designing things for, right? Uh, whether it's a big four cloud providers or small, really niche providers within specific industries, none of that matters. Uh, the thinking that you have to put into play so that you can translate what is needed from a business standpoint to what is needed from a consumer standpoint, that is really what you're bringing to the table the variety that you can think around, variations of what people would think, how they would ask, your ability to work with other folk who will ingest that and train bots, that's the job. The channel output is neither here nor there and really does not require uh, any significant shift in the kind of uh, uh, personnel, right? So, the only shift in, per, in, in, uh, in difference of salary would be at a leadership level and experience level, okay? And Alice just uh, mentioned that just now. So we have about seven minutes left. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. And I think this next question or this next pair of questions could be a good way to end. So mike if you want to start us off with how valued is a successful copywriting digital and traditional background for getting hired and what roles migrate well to the conversation designer role in your experience that's a great interesting question um i think a copywriting background i mean by nature 
a copywriter is dealing with words, language, um, storytelling, if you will. So as a baseline, I think a copywriter in general is a great starting place and baseline for somebody who would be looking to get into the space. Um, as we've talked about on the last few calls, I think really being able to demonstrate how you can transfer past experience into new experience, um, really bring in sort of that psychology user focused thinking to the lens of copywriting, I think is um, very important. When I think about copywriters and if there's any sort of specialty in that regard that may be a leg up is I love anybody who's spoken about creating various iterations of copy for different types of user types. So maybe it's folks who have run um, a, a national campaign but catered the messaging based on specific geographies. Maybe it's somebody who's worked on web, digital applications and written for new users, existing users, potential users, and power users. Being able to say or show that you can tell a similar story or conversation, but personalize that to a specific user or person, I think makes for a very successful skill set in the space. And, and one sort of out of the box thing that I'd like to add is we've actually looked a lot and, and had a lot of success in working with people who have experience in screenwriting and even comedians. So people who have written scripts for movies or um, various types of creative, we have worked with very successfully with people who are comedians prior to entering the space. If you can demonstrate that you can write, that you can cater words, that you can personalize those in different ways. Um, I think that that makes for a great transition from whatever copywriting or past experience you had into this more dynamic, personalized, interactive um, medium. Yeah, so uh, I like that answer coming from the traditional space. I do have a different perspective. It doesn't mean that my perspective is right and that Mike's is wrong. It means that this is so new that there are a number of ways to handle it. My perspective is that unlike the traditional space where you're writing for someone to read, okay, here we are thinking ahead of time of how someone will ask something. And you don't get to write a script for them. Uh, I have not been... I've not been successful in bringing traditional writers into the space because they want to show, here's how I think someone should say something. And invariably, the user never does it the way that you expect. All of the, the, the dialogue design is really around thinking through how, how would Mike ask this? And if he asked this, what would he understand? And Mike might be a North American male living on the West Coast who culturally responds to communication one way versus Lance on the East Coast. You enlarge that and go to the Asia Pacific region or you go to the EU and the way that we speak about things is different. And so it is and, and I don't get to script that for the user. The user is going to script that for me. What I have to do is design dialogue that can be trained into a bot so that it can possibly understand what Mike is saying when Mike makes a request, right? And intelligently respond back. So I do get to, you know, we get into places where we talk about where we're writing scripts for this specific narrative, but really all of that gets broken down to words and phrases and in an ad hoc fa fashion is kind of put together by the, by the MOU um, so that uh, someone can understand something coming back. So I really never really get to write, yeah? I do get to think about how people communicate. Um, and as such, I don't view the, the value of the traditional copy background as highly as some others do. I don't have a disdain for it, 
but I've just not found success at, at that open mind to, to, to drop what traditional coffee has been for folks and to adopt something something new. But Mike might, you know, Mike's a smarter guy than I. He might have far more success at it and pull those kind of things out from people. I think that's a good point. And as a very quick response, um, I, I totally agree. I think I'm approaching things from more of a marketing brand type of experience. That's a lot of the experiences that I'm personally managing. But to, to Lance's point, I totally agree that when it becomes more computational, when we're really talking about enterprise AI, it's, it's sort of that ability to know that there is no one script fits all, there is no 10 scripts fits all, but I need to be mindful of all possibilities are there. So I would just uh, agree with Lance and say that um, maybe the distinction is there are a lot of brand marketing type of experiences that I'm working on releasing with clients right now. Other ones to, to Lance's point are more um, back-end, functional, AI-driven utility type of experiences, um, which we work on as well. However, I do think that a traditional copywriter may be more successful on the side of marketing type experiences as opposed to living, breathing, ongoing, AI-driven type of experience. Good points raised. Um, I think Lance's point um, gave me a perspective that I haven't really looked at before. So, um, yeah, that was that was really interesting. But I do see I do see how that that would work. Um, I think um, there's a few different factors. So, if someone is so important for someone to be able to be like emotionally aware when they're creating conversations, there's a lot of different ways a conversation can go. So whether that's you know, that works well from someone that's from a copy and write, uh, copywriting background or maybe someone from an audio background, you know, it, it's, I don't know if there's one uh, right or wrong answer here. Um, I think it's definitely valued and there are companies out there that have um, actual copywriters in these posi uh, positions writing, um, writing these scripts, um, but others there aren't. So I think it's, again, on a on a case by case basis in the company and, and their perspective on it. Um, but, you know, someone that's able to write a good conversation, does it necessarily have to be from a copywriting background? I don't know. I think as long as someone's able to bring creativity to uh, a conversation, think outside the box, because no conversation is ever the same. Every single conversation you know, even if you're working for the same company is going to be completely different, um, you know, depending on the scenario. So I think it's more um, about the person. But again, I have seen um, copywriters be successful in this industry. Um, so there's definitely a place for it. I think, again, it's just on a on a case by case basis, just to be really quick. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's fair. Just to add a couple more sentences on this, um, what everybody said, I think that's interesting. I haven't worked with copywriters in this space, and I think that some of the challenges um, and advantages to that role transitioning um, have been laid out pretty well. I think particularly I was thinking along the lines of Lance, where it's just a different modality. And as long as you can shift, as long as you're flexible um, and you show that you're a good hire, regardless of where you came from, but yeah, you know, things are different, whether they're written on the page or spoken aloud or um, via chat, um, let alone just traditional copy. Um, but I would just want to add the second half of this question. What roles migrate? Well, you know, keeping all that in mind that as long as the flexibility and the passion are there. Um, I think one thing we haven't talked about is the traditional sort of conversational space that had gone a bit stagnant over the years just basic IBR uh, prompting, right? Um, as long as you find somebody in that space who is flexible and is passionate and is looking to the way uh, those interfaces are evolving now, that's a good place to pull from as well. So it's a different type of writing that they've done, probably more directed dialogue and things like that. And we need them to sort of expand, whereas a copywriter, maybe we need them to 
focus, you know, um, so it just depends on who you're bringing in. But you mentioned people from the audio, obviously just ling linguists, um, even if they're not computational linguists, you can pull in a linguist um, who can consider a lot of these factors, they're going to automatically think about a lot of these factors. So, you know, just some other places to pull people from business analysts, um, voice architects, things like that as well. And with that, we are going to wrap up. So thank you all so much. The panelists, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your thoughts and your insights and your time today. Uh, attendees, thank you for tuning in. If you want access to the things we talked about during the session and in the chat, you can find that in the Discord channel. And we have also posted the winner of the emoji contest. So check Botmok's Twitter for that, and we will follow up with you if you have won a mask. So again, thank you all so much. I hope you have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. And we hope to see you at the next AMA. Thank you all. Thanks for hosting, Brielle. Bye, everyone.